just open in prayer. Father, I just thank you for so many people coming to warm their hands and their feet at the fireside. And Lord, I just pray that for the presence of the Holy Spirit here this morning and for you to touch us, speak to us, help us. Let us hear your voice, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've got a few notices and then just to um, warm you up, at one in, before I start to speak, I'm going to ask if we can speak in tongues. We will, stay on, we will stay muted so nobody else will hear. If you don't speak in tongues, that's no problem. Um, I would say just praise the Lord in your own tongue because that's what we're doing. We're praising the Lord. But I want the Holy Spirit to know that he's welcome here. So those of us that do speak in tongues, we will only do it for a minute or so. But I would just like to introduce because we really so want the Holy Spirit to be here and to be alive as we, as, as we go through the morning. First of all, I just want to say thank you for those of you who are on your third fireside. Um, this is the third standalone meeting and we're still fitting into the theme of resilience and endurance. And as you know, the aim is to get this teaching out to the nation. Um, and I think there are one or two people here for the first time and uh, you're really welcome. I know Anne Brown is here for the first time and I think um, one or two others. So we're we're thrilled to have new people joining us. Um, and thank you to those of you who've invited other people. So there are new people learning about what Flame teaches, for which we're really grateful. Um, now, there's no prayer ministry at the, at, um, in um, the fireside. The reason being is that we just don't have the scope to do it. And it, we we're not 100% certain it's the right way to do it. But what we would like to do, if anybody feels they need a little bit of personal prayer as a result of the teaching, um, then we have got a helpline that what so and to get to access the helpline, I've got two or three people who are willing to ring you. So you would need to email Karen and um, with your telephone number and somebody would ring you not necessarily today uh, but next week and we will arrange for people to ring you but we just feel there needs to be a backup opportunity after the fireside because some of the things we touch on are quite painful so that's something that we're offering now but that, and the way to access it is through Karen with your telephone number um right um i wonder if i could, we've prayed could we could we just uh, pray in tongues for a couple of minutes but in the name of jesus we just ask for the holy spirit to brood over us as we praise you either in our own tongue or in or our own language or in another in, in a heavenly language and we just pray you'd hear us and our hearts cry to meet with you afresh this morning in, in jesus name amen Thank you. Praise the Lord. I just want to give the Lord a clap <laughs> um, because he, you know, he's just great. And I'm mindful that I'm slightly short of time for what I've got to say. And I'll try not to bore you too much because I'm the host this morning. Can I just say if anybody has a testimony of forgiveness from the last fireside would you tell your facilitators and we might be able to hear it at the end because testimonies are really encouraging so when we go into breakout rooms if any of you really have got a testimony where you chose to forgive from the last fireside at that teaching uh, then do tell your facilitators um I've just come back. I had the privilege of going to Samos in Greece and thankfully I wasn't quarantined when I came back. I've been listening to some extraordinary teaching on the end times from Daniel and his prophecies in chapters 7 to 12 and Matthew 24. If anybody is interesting in a, interested in an app called Frontier Alliance International headed up by an American called Joel, Joel Richardson, it is some of the best teaching I have heard on the end times. 
And what I would recommend, and I've just had huge revelation, and really it's just by reading the word of God, um, but it was just explained in such a helpful way. Um, you know, and it, you know, we are in the end times, but I believe we're just in the birth pains at the moment. I think most commentators I've been reading are saying we're definitely in a time uh, where we're going through the birth pains. And I think all of us would probably agree to that. Um, and of course, um, you know, we are told in Matthew 24, we need to stand firm to the end. And I hope that this teaching that we do on the far side is going to help us all to stand firm because we need resilience and endurance. We don't have to be fearful. We just have to be resilient and expectant that we can trust the Lord. But what I will say is we're in a spiritual battle and we as Christians, we need to engaging without fear in area where the, ro the enemy wants to rob, steal and destroy. But we need to, uh, we don't need to be fearful, but we need to understand our authority in Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 10 verses three to four, it says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight are not with weapons of the world. On the contrary, they, are, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And what does this mean? You know, I often have read that and I thought, what does that mean? And a stronghold is many things, but it can be an area in our lives or in somebody else's life that is blocking our growth or their growth as a Christian. And it's like a roadblock. We just can't get through. It might be fear, anger, pain, rejection. Um, it could be witchcraft. It could be other worship of foreign gods. There could be things which get in the way of our relationship with Jesus. And for sure, it doesn't come from Jesus. Strongholds do not come from Jesus. It's an area where the enemy has control. Of course, we, whatever we do, whatever we have, we would always say as a deliverance ministry, we would always say you have to take Satan's rights away. And so we need to forgive where there needs to be forgiveness. We need to repent um, um, where there needs to be repentance, which is the start of removing the stronghold. Um, uh, uh, sorry. Um, no, I've lost my place. Um, um, we're, we're going to, and today we're speaking about the Lordship of Jesus. And once we really make Jesus Lord of every part of our lives, we, this will also help to demolish strongholds. And one of the spiritual weapons that we have at our disposal is the blood of Jesus. In Revelation 12, 11, it says they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And, you know, the blood that, that, that is being talked about in Revelation is the blood of the Lamb, who is Jesus, as you know. And in, one, in John 1, 29, it talks about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we need to apply the blood of Jesus to strongholds, which first we have to identify. You know, during the Passover in the Old Testament, when the Lord led the Israelites out of Egypt, the Jews had to kill a lamb and apply the blood to their door lintels and the angel of death would not kill their firstborn. And in Exodus 12, 21 to 23, this is what it says. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will, um, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. 
you know and we now live under the new covenant and we know that so we live in in the covenant where jesus reigns and we but we still have to apply the blood to our lives and we do it not by dipping the hyssop into the basin where the the la the blood of the lamb is uh we use um uh, we do it by we look we do it by covering with the blood but with the word of our testimony and we use the blood that jesus shed for us on the cross to forgive our sins and give us eternal life you know i'm forever grateful that i met with jesus when i was 29 and that as at that time you know my sins were forgiven and um i you know and i ha and i have eternal life now how do we apply jesus blood as it says in Revelation 12, 11, it says by the word of our testimony. So when I testify about the blood of Jesus, it becomes available in my situation, in my circumstances. And there is also personal testimony of believers, which is centered on the word of God. What must be we do to testify personally to what the word says the blood does for us so we have to we have to testify about the blood uh, through the word of god and our testimony when we speak it out is the action that triggers the process and brings satan's defeat in that area so let me explain because it's a little complicated so i get attacked and satan feeds my mind with a lie and puts me into fear fear of man so using ephesians 1 7 so i'm using the word of god i say through the blood of jesus i'm redeemed out of the hand of the devil and i will not fear man and you know, when I fear man these days, and I still do, I would say through the blood of Jesus, I am redeemed out of the hand of the devil and I will not fear man. As we proclaim it, as we proclaim the word of God and explain that it's through the blood of Jesus, then the enemy doesn't have the same rights as he had before. So I'm able to break the stronghold of fear by applying the blood of Jesus using the word of God by my testimony i also use this weapon when i feel sickness coming in so i use 1 corinthians 6 19 and 20. i confess and i proclaim and while i was on holidays i just felt one morning i felt something on my throat and i didn't want a sore throat so i said my body is a temple of the holy spirit redeemed cleansed sanctified by the blood of jesus therefore the devil has no place in me and no power over me and i ask you for healing lord jesus and i did that several times and my throat went, my bad throat went away and you know what i'm doing is using the word of god and my testimony to apply the blood of jesus and this weapon from revelation 12 11 to destroy from uh, will destroy strongholds uh, that are holding us and others back you know it, it, uh, other people have strongholds and we need to help them by applying the blood of jesus and um to let today i've come to the end because i want to hand over to richard today let us ask the lord to help us to remember to use this weapon these are weapons that have been put into our hands the blood of jesus and the word of our testimony and using the word of god to apply the blood of jesus to defeat the enemy and there's a great book called um spiritual warfare of at the end times i'm not sure if you can see that but um I, th this is it's such a helpful book and it just helps us to understand so it's spiritual warfare for the end times so helpful by Derek prince so can i just pray and then i'll introduce richard 
And I'm sure you've got questions. I'm sure you want to say, Jan, what about this? Or what about the other? I think when you go into your groups, if you've got any questions, but what we want to do through the fireside, of course, is help people to have tools to help them to endure and be resilient. And I believe the blood of the lamb by the word of our testimony is one of those tools. So Lord, I just thank you. And today we cover ourselves. Um, with the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony and lord today as we hear richard speak i just pray for an anointing on richard as he speaks on the drama on the testimony and i just pray that you would minister to us as he speaks to us in jesus name amen now i'm going to hand you over to reverend richard hutchins who is a trustee of flame international and is the vicar of Catherington and Clanfield Parish Churches in Hampshire. And now he's going to come and speak to us on the Lordship of Jesus. Is that oh, thank you, Jan. Yeah, um, and what a delight it is to be here this morning. And I say my most humble apologies for being late. Um, ironically, I'll talk about Lordship over time and mind. Forgive me, Lord, if I let that slip this morning, because my mind had a different time and here i was slightly late but anyway the lordship of jesus right at the heart of our discipleship at the heart of who we are at, as believers growing in christ likeness and so we'll just talk through some points starting off with the meaning of the lordship of jesus because jan shared when she was 29 she came to believe in jesus and that is the starting point it come, we come into the kingdom of god as we proclaim Jesus as our Saviour and our Lord, as we confess in the words of Romans, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart that, G that God saved him from the dead, then we are saved. That is a stepping off point on a journey of discipleship to become uh, more like Jesus and for Jesus to become Lord in our lives. What does this Lordship thing mean? Well, first of all, it's putting God's ways first. It's asking Jesus to be king of our life, that sovereign part. It's asking Jesus just to be in charge of every area of our lives. And it's giving Jesus permission to search us out, to try us, to know us, to reveal what is wrong and what changes we need to make to restore that lordship. And it's a free choice. I can choose today whether to allow Jesus to be fully Lord in my life or not. I could choose whether I submit to Jesus' authority as king. Jesus won't impose control over my life as he's given me free will. He's given you free will. Each of us has this choice. But, and here's the thing, the more we choose to surrender, the more we choose to submit and hand over to the lordship of Jesus, the more we receive from him, the more we receive him, and the more we become like him. And that is the discipleship journey in a nutshell, isn't it? To grow, to become like Jesus. And so learning to make Jesus Lord of every part of our lives as believers requires God's grace. It's impossible without his help or guidance. Can't do it in our own strength. And Titus says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So that's, yes, what Lordship is in a nutshell, but why? Why bother? Why is it important? But it comes down to that heartfelt need for discipleship, apprenticeship to Jesus, becoming more like Jesus is. If we have that passion as believers for Jesus, we will want to glorify him. We will want to become more like him. And Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he'll obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. So when we align our lives the word of God with Jesus, we're aligning ourselves well, through the word of God with Jesus, with truth, with life. And what does that do for us? Well, it draws us closer in our relationship with Father God, with Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit. It makes us more like Jesus. 
and we'll see more of the character of Jesus in our lives. We'll become more and more the people that Jesus has made us to be. We're created to be exactly like him. And we won't get there in this life, but we can be as close to that as possible. And we will fulfill our God-given purpose and destiny. We'll produce lasting fruit in our lives. We'll bring blessing to those around us. And we'll be under Jesus' headship or covering, giving us spiritual protection. What does that look like at this time of COVID-19, coronavirus? Well, actually, I think if we declare Jesus Lord and we hand ourselves fully over to the Lordship of Jesus, what it'll do is it will give us a confidence. It will make us more confident in the foundation in who is holding us in their arms. It will help us to grow and it will help us to witness that to those around us and it will grow the kingdom. And so Lordship of Jesus, handing ourselves over to that obedience is essential for our growth as believers. And I believe it's really essential for the world around us at the moment that they see this Lordship in our lives. They see our submission and the good that that does and the fruit that that brings into the lives of those around us, because then we witness to the kingdom. But making Jesus Lord isn't perhaps a one-off thing, all sorted and in it, done, dusted and happy. It's a process. It's a journey. It's sometimes troubling. It's sometimes difficult. And I myself, and I've been on mission uh, a couple of times to Armenia. I've been reflecting and preparing here. And there was a point where while I, as a man under authority, I go on mission. I'm under the team leader's authority, which was Jan. However, there are guidelines on mission, which is don't go off on your own. And I wandered off on my own in a part of Armenia and I came back and I had permission to do so. But actually, I was probably challenging the authority and the lordship of that mission. And I think that is part of why a couple of days later, I was really struck down with quite a long lasting, you know, nasty bug of the bowel, shall we say. That lasted for 10 days after we got back off that mission. And it was only through some prayer with Jan and things and restoring, confessing, repenting and putting things back in the right order in terms of lordship and other things that that was resolved. So we can stumble on this journey of discipleship. But as we travel forwards and we do offer ourselves to offer Jesus lordship of our lives, that becomes our holiness. We are sanctified, made holy. It's the process by which we overcome sin and we become, as I say, more like Jesus. But it can only be done with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus by our side. This is not an individual thing. And there's a lovely little drama that we do on mission. And if I can share my screen and sound successfully now, I will play that. So. Now, here we have Natalie, who is. Uh, driving along. She's an unbeliever. She enjoys life. She enjoys speeding along the road and she likes to wave at all her friends and uh, making sure that they know that she exists, that she's there. She's full of life. And then she takes um, a bend, which is a little bit too tight for her, but she manages to keep the car on the road. Um, and there she goes, uh, enjoying life. But then Jesus comes along and he knocks on the window of her life and he tells her that he died for her, that her sins would be forgiven um, and that he, he rose again in order that she could have eternal life and offers her the opportunity to, uh, to accept him into her life. She hands over the driving wheel, the steering wheel of her life. And here they are it, it, driving along at a, sensible, at a sensible speed and enjoying sweet fellowship, knowing and Natalie knows that Jesus is Lord of her life and she is having a marvellous time and then corruption comes along. Natalie lost her job and she needs money um, and she's being offered money. 
But actually, she knows now that Jesus is in her life, she will not accept it. And she carries on. And life is good for her while Jesus is in the driving seat of his car. But then, of course, uh, fear comes along. And uh, this this fear is so worried because of the, the, her family situation, the family who she can't visit in hospital. And all this fear is overwhelming and the anxiety and worry is coming over. And Natalie is worried about her job and she invites anxiety and fear to come and sit in her car. And then she takes the driving wheel from Jesus. And of course, that means that Jesus then gets relegated to the back of her car in this instance. Then we have coronavirus comes along. There is a spirit of infirmity that has come along and Natalie's very nervous about it and um, invites the fear of sickness to come into her life and into her car. And again, Jesus gets pushed around in her life and there she is driving along and then of course corruption comes back again and corruption this time she knows she needs money and of course Jesus is not at the center of her life and so she accepts that money and corruption comes and sits in the front of her car and this time um, Jesus gets kicked out of the car and he's actually in the boot of the car and right at the back of her life a sudden they crash onto the floor but Jesus is the God of the second third fourth um, uh, chance he never abandons us and he saw what Natalie's heart had been like, that she, he, that she had accepted him into her heart. And so he comes along and he talks to her and he says, I'm willing to come and be Lord of your life again. And so this time Natalie welcomes him in and he gives, she gives him the steering wheel of her car and she and then she kicks out corruption. She kicks out the spirit of infirmity and she kicks out fear and anxiety. And then they come and they sit down and they enjoy sweet fellowship once again. And Jesus is Lord of her life. And so a simple drama, but just illustrating how easy it is and illustrating us. Thank you to the drama team. I've seen some clapped hands, uh, in, um, icons and things. Thank you so much for your, um, well, your resilience, your creativity and everything you've done. And sometimes on mission, I wish we had as much space as a garden to do the dramas in, but uh, no, wasn't it good? And just showing how easy it is for the things of life is to just put those in a place of um, importance in our lives that pushes Jesus more to the back seat or out and the second third fourth chance that jesus gives always ready always waiting to come at our invitation and be lord and as we do that that's um we will get the help of jesus through the power of the holy spirit but also in that we get authority as believers over the works of satan and so we can declare this lordship into our lives and jesus will will come and so the key to that lordship is obedience you know, john 14 15 if you love me you will obey what i command that's absolutely fundamental you know, our love is expressed in obedience and so we submit our will to jesus will it's like tristan when he said about forgiveness last week was saying actually when we choose to forgive in those ways we submit our judgment and allow god to be judged well here in lordship of jesus we submit our will and we say lord your will not mine the lord's prayer thy will be done that's right at the heart so being obedient means we make our choices that are aligned with what we're told the words we have in scripture that's our guide that's our line that is what we do and this will bring transformation in our lives 
Romans that says we don't conform to the pattern of this world, but we'll be transformed in the renewing of our mind. And then we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. But this isn't straightforward all the time. It's quite often a battle to get um, sin from specific areas of our life. And we'll have to go back again and again. And we'll stumble, we'll fall and we'll come back. And we'll stumble, and we'll fall and we'll come back. And the grace and mercy of Jesus is that he says, yes, but you're back and forgives. It means dying to self and that may involve suffering. And it may even go as far as to lay down one's life for Christ. I think back into that drama of a journey. We saw there that the Natalie inviting Jesus in, but these things that crowded in, the fears, the things of the world that got in the way, and they could have come again and again. We all have areas of weakness. And so there's a prayer that goes with this session that we'll come to shortly, which really is a brilliant prayer to pray for the first time declaring lordship but is worth praying again and again and again because it goes through areas of our life in a systematic way to check where we're at and to offer them back in submission but before we come to that uh, there's a testimony from tristan about the lordship of jesus in his life good morning um i'm just going to share a short testimony of when i first submitted every year of my life to, to the Lord Jesus. Um, I guess before that, I, I can say that I've been a believer um, all of my life, ever since the age of four, as, as, as long as I can remember. Um, but my relationship with him, um, I guess, was quite, um, quite distant, not very, not very close, not a very intimate relationship. Um, particularly in my 20s, I, I struggled a lot with, with, with my sinful nature. Um, I was held captive, held, held bound by by several several sins, and I, I really couldn't shake shake these off. Um, and I guess also my my understanding um, of my of my life with Jesus was that I had invited Jesus to join me in what I was doing in in my life, and so that that was sort of the understanding that I that I had um, of of Jesus. And then when I um, Four years ago, um, I, I really um, knew that there was so much uh, more of the Christian life that I, more of Jesus, more of walking with him that I didn't yet know. And you know, reading what the disciples and apostles were like, I'm like, well, that's nothing like my life. And the Lord was really calling me to, to surrender my life to him, to submit um, all areas of my life to him and to truly pick up my cross and follow him and be his disciple, whatever the cost would be. And in that journey of, 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 of um, seeking that, um, the Lord asked me, he said, Tristan, you know, would you be willing um, to be my disciple, even if it would mean that um, you may never get married and you may never have a family or children. Um, you have to submit that to me now. And and um, would you be willing to be my disciple, even if I'm calling you to do that? And I was in my late twenties, and I've got, I wanted a I wanted a family, I wanted a wife, and so it was such a hard thing to do at the time. But I dug deep in my heart, and I knew because I, I trusted His ways more than mine. I wanted Him to to be Lord over these areas rather than me. Um, I surrendered that to him and so deeply that I even expected uh, never to be married because um, because I, I, I'd so deeply surrendered that to him. And then the Lord asked me, you know, Tristan, to be my disciple, would you be willing even to, to lay down your life for me, um, say on the mission field, even within the next handful of years? Um, can you submit the the manner and the timing of your death to me? And and again i had to search deep in my heart but eventually i could say yes i'm i'm willing to do that if that's what you're calling me to do and i submitted um the manner of my timing at uh, the manner and time of my death to the lord jesus and ever since then like when i when i did that i something enormous changed in my relationship with the lord and i i was suddenly i was, I was so much closer with him and um, my relationship with him is so much more intimate and I knew him 
I felt like I'd really met with him um, because I'd surrendered to him and I'd claimed him as Lord over over these hidden areas of my life which I'd never um, submitted to him before. And and I knew I could trust him and I had peace um, about these things. I had peace about, about marriage. I had peace about um, the manner and time of my death because I'd submitted it to the Lord Jesus and I trusted in his ways so much more than mine. Um, and what that did also is it freed me from um, from the fear of death. I went on my first mission trip with with Flame um, a month after this happened, and I didn't fear death anymore. I didn't fear going on mission because I'd surrendered my life to the Lord, and and that was so freeing and and it was so good to do that. Um, and in the same way. Um, I actually got uh, I met my wife about six months after I surrendered my marriage um, to the Lord, um, and I, I really wrestled like, why, Lord, why are you why are you giving me a, a wife? Why are you giving me a family? I I was I was willing I was so willing to be single, but He said to me, all I all I wanted you to do was submit it to me, so that I could give you what I wanted to give you in my ways and not yours. My ways are so much greater than your ways, and, and I'm so grateful to the Lord for that. And I have to continue to surrender um, areas of my life to the Lord, particularly uh, the lives of my children. And that's really tough sometimes, but I know I can trust in him and I prefer his ways rather than mine. So it's a continual submission, but I, I love now to surrender and I trust to surrender to the Lord Jesus in all areas of my life. Thank you, Tristan, for being open and for that testimony. I think there's just a couple of things. It's interesting to see the differentiation that Tristan puts between the mode of belief and then handing over lordship. Two different things at different times. And his description of belief and his view that, well, Jesus had joined him on his journey. And then this lordship of actually handing over his life to walk with Jesus. But that, that's a digging deep. That's not a no effort thing. That's a milling and a, a really working through stuff thing. And I can share that sense of having to dig deep and really search. But the fruit of it, peace and freedom were words that Tristan used. And, you know, that's such a gift, such a, a gracious thing that we get as we declare Jesus as Lord. And the word I sort of write, wrote down, actually in the middle of seeing this testimony again, was right. What we're doing, we're taking away that word that we hear, that word that we hear so often, that's my right. And we say, Lord, it's your right. You have your way. And the Lordship Prayer really does that. It covers all aspects of life and it helps us to identify it really does chime with psalm 26 test me lord and try me examine my heart and my mind go deep help me to dig help me to mill through everything in my life and it goes through line by line and we will say this prayer at the end of this session in a very few minutes it just starts with an acknowledgement of our need for jesus and our acceptance of his lordship and and as savior and redeemer and deliverer and it's an invitation to come to rule. And then it goes through a series of submitting prayers. I submit my spirit to you, my worship, my conscience, my spiritual understanding. So where do we put our worth? Yeah, Lord, come show me the idols in my life, because we quite often carry those completely unintentionally, but they grow. How do we respond to God when he pricks our conscience? Are we wanting more of God in our lives? So that covers that. I submit my mind, my thoughts, my understanding, my imagination. What do we do when the fiery darts of the enemy come and put unwelcome thoughts in our minds? What do we turn to then? Do we insist on understanding, on rationalizing and intellectualizing things, or do we wait in faith on the Lord? What do we let? our minds drift into in idle moments. I submit my will, my intentions, my decisions. That really is at the heart, isn't it? We are willful people, undoubtedly. Yeah, we, we all want sometimes our own way. And it can be so difficult to lay that down and say, Lord, actually in this, your way 
not what I think is best, but what you have in store, no matter what that looks like. Will we be obedient even when it's not what we want? Should we stop doing stuff? Should we start doing stuff? When we make decisions, who do we consult first? Ourselves, our friends, or our God? I submit my emotions, feelings, reactions. At this time, that may well be fear. It may well be loneliness. It may well be all sorts of things. It may well be separation. What do we do when our emotions overflow? Or are we free to express ourselves emotionally? And I know for myself, that's one that I have struggled with even in the last weeks of actually just expressing feelings where they needed to be expressed and in an open and frank way. I probably need healing from the Lord for that myself. But do we let the deep Lord come to minister to the deep wounds, release our guilt, help us to grieve well in him, but also experience the deep joy that he brings. Do we submit our body, physical health, what we do, what we say, how we treat our body, what we do with it, all the different parts, what we do with our tongue, what we listen to, what we look at, all of those things. Do we hand those over to the Lord? Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do we care for ourselves properly and well? Our sexuality and, the ex and all of its expressions, yeah, are we happy in our own skin as God has made us? Do we accept the truth of marriage as between one man, one woman? Do we seek images of sexuality where we shouldn't? Do we turn them off when they come on the television? Do we actively seek them out through the internet? All those things where we could just trip and take, yeah, take our sexuality and submit it to something other than Jesus. Our finances, material goods, do we steward them in the way Jesus would have us do it or are we holding on ourselves? Submitting time. One for me to learn from again today, but our work, our free time, our sleep, and our work or lack of it, particularly in these times around coronavirus and everything that's going on, do we submit the situation we find ourselves in to the Lord and say, Lord, thy will be done in this or do we fight it? Do we rail against it? Do we get angry with God that is letting things happen to us? We submit our relationships, family, marriage, church, fellowship. And actually, that's quite an interesting one at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, because a lot of those relationships are more strained, are more distant, are very constrained by circumstances at the time. So how do we hand that back, the dissatisfaction in relationships that aren't all we wish they would be. They just you know, hand it back, submit it to the Lord, friendships as well. And are the boundaries in our relationships godly boundaries? And then submitting our futures. We heard Tristan talk, so that's the next one, but our futures, our ambitions, our future plans. Do we allow the Lord to guide? Do we take the next step that the Lord puts in front of us? Or have we got our own plans going on all the time, our own ambitions? It's an interesting one here. Do we look at horoscopes? Do we seek other ways of divining the future? Are we opening ourselves up to spiritual attack through that? Particularly in uncertain times, it could be so easy to grab for this, to grab for that, and to look for something else that will say, this is the way ahead. Do we look to the Lord and do we offer him lordship of that? And then as Tristan spoke about, do we submit to the Lord the manner and timing of our death? Every day is a gift. There's a friend of mine um, who, as she says, she wakes up in the morning, she says, thank you, Lord, for another gift, a gift of another day. Just one day at a time to serve the Lord. That is submitting the manner and timing of our death to the Lord. It's just saying in your time, in your way, and out of that will come such freedom. Freedom from fear and freedom just to let Jesus be Lord. And what happens when we make Jesus Lord? Well, Tristan spoke about it. Peace, freedom. We grow in our likeness to Jesus. We receive the Holy Spirit. And so that dove can sit in our lives and bring us power. 
we have victory over Satan. James says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's all about Jesus' lordship. Our prayers are heard in heaven, and then in Job, it says, submit to God and be at peace with him in this way. Prosperity will come to you. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. This is God's given prosperity. These are the good things, the destiny that God has for us. And then Philippians 4. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This lordship thing is not a case, sirrah, sirrah, stoicism. Oh, that's just the way it is. But it's submission to the will of God. And just one other thing from Tristan's testimony before we say the lordship prayer. He handed to God the likelihood of him getting married to the point where he thought God had said to him, that's not going to happen. And yet out of that has come his family. The Lord has said, this is the plan I have for you, a way to prosper you. you know, those words from Jeremiah 29 in his life in marriage are fulfilled there. So when we submit, when we give ourselves to the Lordship of Christ, don't be surprised when things happen that you thought were being laid aside as well, because God desires to bless and to bless and to bless again his children. And so in terms of um, the Lordship prayer, I will run through that prayer now. And then I will leave a gap between each section for you to say it. This is a little bit like our mission, I say, you say, but we don't have a translator in the middle. So that makes it a little bit easier. So I will just say a little line it's, uh, uh, and we will go through it. So let's pray. Let's offer Jesus ourselves to be Lord of our lives. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge my need of you. And I accept you now as my Lord, my Saviour, my Redeemer, and my Deliverer. I invite you now to come and rule and reign in every area of my life. I submit my spirit to you. My worship, my conscience, and my spiritual understanding. I submit my mind to you. My thoughts, my understanding, and my imagination. I submit my will to you my intentions, and all of my decisions. I submit my emotions to you. All my feelings and reactions. I submit my body to you. My physical health, all I do and say. I submit my sexuality and all of its expressions to you. I submit my finances and my material goods to you. I submit my time to you, my work, my free time, and my sleep. I submit all my relationships to you, my family, my marriage, my church fellowship my friendships. I submit all of my plans, my ambitions, and my future into your hands. 
I submit to you, Lord, the manner and timing of my death. Lord Jesus, I thank you that your blood was shed so that I might be free and cleansed. I recommit myself to you, body, soul, and spirit. Amen. <laughs>